I think you need someone that's in the data, day to day, someone that's really combing through and understanding what the data is telling you, understanding where the gaps in data and where we need to build that bridge. joining this episode of Go-To-Market Excellence. Today, our guest is Zach Quintanilla. He is business analyst at SearchSpring, a San Antonio-based tech company that helps online e-commerce stores with their merchandising and search so that online shoppers can easily find the products they're looking for. As a business analyst, Zach is particularly focused on making the entire go-to-market function operate efficiently and effectively at SearchSpring. So we're really glad he could join us. Zach, Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, I appreciate you having me. I'm excited to dive in and let's talk data and RevOps. Well, let's do it. Let's get right into it. I'm going to put you on the spot. You're the CEO of a software startup. You crossed 50, 75 employees and you're somewhere between one and five million ARR. Who do you hire first, Zach? A business analyst or a head of RevOps? I got to go with the business analyst. I think you need All right. someone that's in the data, day to day, someone that's really combing through and understanding what the data is telling you, understanding where are the gaps in data and where we need to build that bridge. And if you bring in kind of a head of rep ops, they're more strategy focused, long term. How do we build out a team? Well, you got to know what the data is telling you first. You got to know what departments need the most help, what processes uh, have bottlenecks and may need just some help kind of streamlining. And you don't know that until you dive into your CRM and just what does the data tell you? What does it look like? How can we fix it? Uh -huh. Is this something that you uh, have experienced firsthand? Is this uh, like, what, why do you believe so strongly that it should be the analyst before the head of RevOps? Yeah, so I kind of found myself falling into this position as a business analyst and it's funny, my first project uh, was for the finance team and it had to do with our MRR reconciliation and just operationally what we're reporting and time to materialize that MRR. And in doing this project, we uncovered a lot of gaps that we simply didn't know prior to the project. Uh, we uncovered really the, what the whole process looks like from we market, we close a sale, we go to implementations, we build it, we implement it, and now we're billing and kind of seeing that full scope and life cycle. Now we know, hey, here's where we need help or, hey, this department's doing great. What else can we do to empower them? But I don't think you can do that without getting into the data, talking to the teams. And maybe that's what a head of RevOps could do, but I still think that their first mission is, okay, let's look high level, let's build a team, Let's go from there. But what if you don't have the budget to do that? And you need a one person multi hat. Let's do as much as possible as quickly as we can. And then we can strategize and build up later. So I really think a business analyst is the way to go. Yeah, that makes, makes good sense. The situation you find yourself in when you first came on at search spring, um, you were the first analyst, I would assume. And then you, did not have a head of RevOps. And I'm just curious uh, who was handling more of the, or who still is handling the RevOps function, the more tech admin, uh, supporting the sales team, um, that type of role, who's handling that right now? Is it still um, being taken on by the sales leader, marketing leader, and they're kind of um, doing that until the pain gets hard enough to, or if the pain gets uh, painful enough to hire a RevOps person, what's, <laughs> what's it currently like at Search Spring? Yeah, so at the moment, we, uh, we're we kind of tag teaming it. We're helping each other, it's very collaborative. We have some power users that can help with uh, some changes and tr some strategy. Uh, but honestly, at the moment, we're hiring for a sales ops role. So if y'all know anybody, definitely let me know. Um, yeah, it, it's well. We've got we've got some RevOps listeners. I'm I'm sure uh, <laughs> there'll be somebody out there who's interested. Sorry, I interrupted. Hey, again. you're good. You're good. Uh, yeah. So I think it's interesting that without a dedicated person in the role, uh, we are somewhat limited, but that makes us just more scrappy, and it 
all of us are now inclined to do the research on, okay, if we were to do this, how would we do it? And now we're looking at trailhead to get up to speed. We're in different community uh, organizations on Slack, asking those questions. And now we're developing more power users because we have to fill that gap. And I love it. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Instead of leaning on yeah. one person, if that person leaves, I mean, it kind of breaks your system. So why not have multiple power users? So by starting with a uh, more data person, a data focused person, as opposed to like a tech person, um, you know, search bring is, has first been able to you've done a lot of work on data modeling, right? Identifying everything you need to measure. Did those conversations start because of um, questions your CEO and CFO weren't able to answer? Did it start because um, you guys were just flying blind? What were the kind of the what was the scenario when you came in where you where you guys first started noticing? Oh, we don't actually have data to report on that. We don't. Uh, have good data here. It's crappy data. Uh, explain, like, take us behind the scenes, I guess, if you would. Yeah, so uh, I think things were running great uh, before I was even onboarded. But I think when I was brought on, we wanted to dive deeper. And so we had all this data and there was reporting available. But I think the missing piece was the insights. So what is this data telling us and how is that going to drive business decisions? And so the data is infinite. You can get data on sales and you can spend weeks building different models, but really you need someone to understand based on the data set we have, what's important and what's noise and having someone to help filter out that noise, literally exporting hundreds of different sheets of data just to make sure you get the right data set and then manipulating that and creating a matrix with different variables and from those variables, hey, we have an aha moment and this is what we should focus on. And there's tons of resources online that can really point you in the right direction. A lot of it's very general, but it can at least feed you ideas of, hey, this is what other people are doing. Maybe we should take a look at that. Do we even have a way to spit out that data? And yeah, so I think really I was brought on to just kind of dive deeper and get those insights bring the insights to the right people, have the right conversations that lead to better decision-making and let's really grow and expand. Hmm. What are some examples of, uh, of, of the insights that you're looking to find? Are, are you, and I guess if you could explain specifically, um, so you're not actually looking to, you don't have any questions you're trying to answer. You're just, um, you know, you're, you're not uh, being prom prompted by questions that the CEO wants to answer. You're simply, um, you know, ingesting all the sales and marketing data, exporting it, and then looking for trends that way. Or, or do you, do you have specific things? I guess take us into the day of, uh, into the day in the life of Zach. Yes. And what questions, like what questions you're trying to answer? Yeah, go ahead. It's a, it's a mix of both. So I do get a lot of ad hoc questions, uh, but really I'm just curious. I love diving in and just seeing what we got, what we can make of it. Uh, but it's funny, I had a conversation yesterday and we we're talking about our churn data and our churn is not bad. I think it's, it's right on the level of industry standard, but we're still kind of questioning how can we get better and mitigate churn. And based on how we're currently reporting it, we do know churn reason. Then we have a sub detail that goes a little bit deeper but we're thinking of changing uh, the naming convention just a little bit, tweak it to where based on the reason selected for churn, we need to get actionable insights from that. Right now we have churn product. Well, okay, what about the product? Uh, was someone else's product better? Was there a feature that was lacking within our, uh, our product? Or what exactly does that mean? And I think uh, sometimes just diving into the notes that different people leave in the CRM about that churn can be super insightful, but it's so much to digest that just tweaking the naming convention of churn and the sub detail of churn reason can really help you pinpoint. And that way, if we say, Hey, this customer left because of product and it was because another competitor had a product feature that was better than ours. Well, Hey, now we know let's put some power around that feature and maybe we can attract more customers and mitigate more risk. And so 
it's ad hoc questions like that where it's just we get some curiosity around a process or um, things happening in the business and it's like hey let's dig in how can we change this and really get some actionable insights and that's a great example if you weren't around how do you think those decisions or um, learnings would have been found or gleaned <laughs> i think it would have happened eventually uh, but i think just being able to sit in a room with different decision makers and just spitball like hey what do you think about this what do you think about that and really helping drive that conversation to okay well we know there's an issue we know there's a gap what are we going to do about it and i feel like sometimes with the multitude of things on everyone's plate it gets hard to do some of those actionable things and it's great to talk about it and it makes sense but i think you need someone dedicated in the role looking at the data having the conversations and then driving those projects forward to make sure we make change to get even better actionable insights because um, uh -huh. yeah I, i've been at past companies where there's a lot of talk of hey we should do this better but we were so busy nothing happened so really i mean a business analyst is an analyst but it's also a project manager how are you driving projects forward to create change so that the data sets better such as what yeah so uh we are doing uh, materialization so we implement something or rather we close the sale it takes x number of months to actually write the code implement, and then invoice so now we know how long it takes. Now what are we gonna do about it? And so we can go to our implementation team, we can track time for different benchmarks of, we get the customer, we do the first pass, second pass, now we leave it up to the customer when they wanna go live. Well, what can we affect? What's in our control? What's out of our control? If we know what's in our control, we know how we can improve that process. And that'll have a trickle down effect of now we're going to materialize faster. And if we materialize faster, then we have cash in bank quicker. And if we have more cash on hand, now we can budget more effectively and maybe hire more people. And so mm. pushing forward this one project is going to have huge cascading effects. And it just really takes someone to be on top of the project to push it forward. Because if we know, hey, our materialization rate could be better. And then we don't do anything about it. I mean, that's money left on the table. So we, we just got to be able to get the right parties involved, pull the right levers, get the right data to make decisions and just let's move on it. Yeah. How about Zach on the customer acquisition side? Where are you seeing, um, where have you been able to identify friction in the customer acquisition process uh, using uh, your data analytics skills? <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. So when I was new to the role, that was one of my first projects was helping. Let's redraft and really understand our ICP. And since I was new to the role and I was living in mountains of data, I did dozens of cross sections, dozens of matrix. Let's do this data and this data. Let's do the industry that our customers are in, the platform that they're on. Uh, do those two looked under the lens together make sense? Do we see anything that's important? Well, let's do our MRR bands. Let's do small to medium enterprise, however you want to slice it. Let's do that transposed on industry. And so we took a ton of variables and just plotted them on top of each other to try and draw insights. And funny enough, we knew going into the project a few things about our customers. And after doing the project, well, turns out we were right. <laughs> we were right on the money of exactly who our ICP is. So it's refreshing to know that we had a good idea. We're hitting the right market. Now we have data to back that up. And we know, hey, let's double down. Let's get more market right. share um, and really prepare our sales team and give them the ammunition to go out and get those customers. And so, I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. How many customers were you, if you wouldn't mind sharing um, at least a range, uh, how many were you analyzing uh, to be able to identify your ICP? Yeah, I think when I started, we looked back all the way to 2017 to mm -hmm. today. So it was 
couple thousand customers, oh, okay. uh, give or take yeah. some churn, some expansion net new. Yeah. And then based on that data set, knowing that a lot of it was old, we really focused on 2020 and Q1 of 2021. And funny enough, it told a slightly different story than the whole data set, but it was still pretty much on par with what we were expecting. For someone who wanted to do a similar analysis that might be listening, what do you think the threshold is for a uh, number of customers in order to do that and feel confident about it? Because 2000 is nice. I mean, that's a nice <laughs> set of customers, you know, but not everybody has that depending on their uh, company size or their, uh, you know, ACV and stuff. Yeah, well, I would suggest, I mean, you definitely want a large sample size so that analysis holds weight. And if you don't have that large sample size, uh, use what you have. Use the last six months, use the last year, all of those customers, and then you're just going to have to do another analysis every year. And does it match? Are you seeing trends of you moving upstream? Is your customer demographic changing based on changes in the market? Is there a new industry that's popped up on the radar and it's growing month over month? Well, why? Did the sales team hit a gold mine and find out, hey, these customers are really resonating with our product. Well, doing this analysis frequently will let you know those triggers and you can act on it more quickly than just a couple of years down the road, be like, hey, our customer base changed drastically. I wonder what happened. Like, do the analysis frequently. Make sure you're targeting the correct customers in the right market. Uh, and if you don't do this analysis frequent enough, I could, you're going to miss out on quite a bit, um, yeah. especially if you're smaller and you're growing fast. Like this is very, very crucial. It certainly is. I mean, you've just given two or three examples of um, insight led decisions that search Spring has been able to make because you've been on board. Talk to the CEO or chief revenue officer or CFO or COO, whoever hires these people. And um, I guess explain uh, what it must feel, what it will feel like for them to have a really kick-ass business analyst on board, and um, kind of like what are the stressors or the uh, stuff that gives those senior leaders anxiety that that uh, a, a great business analyst can, can come in and relieve. Yeah. So I think the difference is a high-level view versus an intimate uh, knowledge of what's happening. Um, those in higher positions have their hands in a lot of pots and they are tied to specific numbers over a long period of time and they have goals for Q1 of 2022 right now. Whereas I live within a narrow scope of I have X, Y, and Z project that I got to get across the finish line this month or even I have an ad hoc report due in two days. And so I think the difference of scope really helps me just be day to day in the data and know pretty immediate if there's trends or something happened that we should be aware of that I can bring on the radar of the exec team. And I think, uh, yeah, if you're looking for a business analyst, get someone that's scrappy, get someone that knows how to talk about numbers, uh, not in a hey, these are the numbers, here you go. It's a, can they tell a story? And is that story persuasive enough to convince exec team to make decisions? And I think yeah. that holds a lot of weight. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that, uh, the interpretation side of that stuff here in a second, and we talk, we'll talk about insights. But uh, one more question on filling a role like this, and I'm particularly talking about early stage companies, Series A, Series B. Um, what are the, where, where, where should they find somebody like you, Zach? <laughs> I mean, it's not like there's a ton of uh, people out there who um, have deep understanding of like a modern B2B SaaS go to market motion, but are also have a high data acumen and, uh, you know, an Excel pro, et cetera, et cetera. So where, uh, if you were advising somebody where they would go recruit somebody like you, where should they look? Yeah, I would highly recommend be open-minded. So... I was a recruiter for a year and then I found myself in SaaS sales. It was very short lived. It was a, a whopping three months 
Uh, and then unfortunately the pandemic hit. And so I found myself looking for a new role and a company took a chance on me. And it just so happened to be an analyst role uh, on a sales team. So I helped 27 sales reps present data to customers to help win over the sale. And so if I, that company didn't take a chance on me, who knows where I'd be. Um, but yeah, definitely in the interview process, just ask about uh, how do you learn? I think that's huge. Someone that's yeah. willing to hop on Google, one of the most powerful resources in anyone's hands at any given moment. Uh, if you hop on Google, you can find the answer to most, most problems. And just having someone that's curious enough to do the research to make sure they're presenting accurate data, presenting accurate stream of thought or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, I think it really takes someone that's curious, willing to learn, scrappy. How about any other skills? Uh, I would imagine attention to detail, um, <laughs> kind of uh, perseverance, not, gi not giving up if, it's, uh, if you're not finding the answer you want on the first, uh, on the first uh, set of data, et cetera. What, what else? Yeah. Other skills? Uh, or, or characteristics? Yeah. If I really had to think about it, um, definitely someone that's collaborative. I mean, you got to get with a bunch of different departments and you can't really wait around for them to come to you with a, a project. You, you got to just go out and make it happen. And you got to make sure that you're, you're sharing the love. You can't focus on one department and do all of their projects. I mean, your ultimate goal is to help the business, to drive revenue. And everybody's involved in that, either actively or passively. And if they're customer facing or not, they have data that's important to the business. And so hearing their story, understanding their data, and being able to present that to others and include them on business decisions is huge. That's right. Now, I want to uh, ask you about something on your on your LinkedIn page, you, you say uh, that you're a data alchemist and you turn ordinary data into gold insights. I love that. Well, first of all, it stands you out. It, 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 uh, differentiates, you from, it differentiates you from every other analyst out there. But also, I want to ask you about this, uh, you turn data into gold insights thing. You, you said in our first conversation that we ever had together that acting on data is difficult. I'm curious, what's the role of the analyst in the insights building portion? Because you described a couple of uh, examples where there was a business problem and you went and investigated and then you were able to bring back um, your findings. But in terms of, uh, you know, it's one thing to have a, a data finding, it's another thing to actually have an insight, an actionable insight. So what do you think the role is of an analyst in doing that? Or, uh, yeah, I'll just stop there. What do you think the role is uh, of an analyst in, in doing that? And where does it start? Where does it stop? Yeah, I think a lot of it is filtering out the noise. Um, so I have talks about this with my boss all the time of when you start a project, you need to put enough time and effort to where you capture the idea or you capture the goal of the question that was asked and then get with whoever gave you the project, talk about it, make sure you're on the right track because it's so easy to get lost and to over-engineer and add way more detail than is actually needed to solve the problem. And so I think that is parallel to providing gold insights out of just data because you can provide a lot of lead and not all of it's very useful. And it's knowing when to just paint a good enough picture that'll build a conversation that'll lead to a different route than what you were originally given. And that's how you find the gold is, uh, hey, I need you to solve for X. Well, before I get to X, let's build a model. Uh, let's call it model A. Okay, is this on the right track? Okay, it is perfect. Well, let's go to B. And you really gotta take your time to get there instead of just saying, oh, I'm gonna solve for X and deliver X. Like, hold on, let's, let's talk about it before we get there. Do you find yourself selling the insights and recommendations to the key leadership at your at a search spring, or uh, do you typically present it and then let them, you know, fight out what it what it means and what the action item should be? Yeah, so I think 
it's more powerful to present the data and then lead the conversation to the answer. That's, that's if you have the answer. Uh, instead of presenting data and telling the exec team what to do, uh, I think you need to get buy-in. And in order to do that, provide pieces of the picture, have those conversations, and then build towards the goal together. Because ultimately, what I think is the best decision, uh, it might not actually be the best because I don't have all of the data or all of uh, the insights that different departments do. Uh, I do live in the data, but I'm not customer facing. Maybe those that are customer facing have a piece of the story that I'm missing. And so even when I do an analysis and I'm like, oh, this is what we should do. Um, I just provide the models, make sure we have time set aside to have that discussion uh, and then kind of lead them towards, hey, this is what I was thinking, but based on your experiences and what you do in your position, does this make sense? Or is there something I'm missing, something that's better? Uh, and if you just presented your answer right up front, that might have ended the conversation and you would have gotten additional insights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can guide future projects too. I'm curious, you mentioned the, uh, the you bring the models, but um, now my next question to that is, okay, how do you actually typically present your findings to <laughs> senior leadership teams. Uh, what's the environment you do that in? Is it one-on-one -on -one meetings? Are you in there in the you know weekly leadership meetings, like um, pr presenting what you're finding? Do you do it in Excel? Do you do it in? Do you pull it all in a PowerPoint? Do you use some kind of like data storytelling tool? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, honestly, I I just use Excel. I love Excel. <laughs> and uh, if you really yeah, if you can template it right, you can make it look gorgeous. Uh, and so you got to hide a couple tabs, really bold to highlight the information that's important to draw the eye. But yeah, I mean, when I present data, I do it all in Excel. Sometimes I'll throw in some nice charts and graphs, you know, add a little flair, but really you got to showcase the data and how you got there. And I think them seeing the work put into that and actually showing them the data set that you used is very powerful, more so than a PowerPoint or anything else I can think of of, hey, I went into this CRM, used this report, this is the data that spit out. When I manipulated it, these are the models that I created. Uh, this is why I use these specific variables. Here are the line items that we need to discuss and then just go from there and just really walk them through that whole process and let them know, uh, hey, this is the scope. You gave me this timeline. This is the amount of work that went into it. Now I know for future projects, hey, I can do this a little bit quicker or Actually, I needed a lot more time uh, because these are all the hurdles I had to overcome. And I think that'll help with scoping down the road. And if you just had a PowerPoint and didn't go over kind of the, the work that went into the model, uh, you might get burnt out pretty quick trying to catch up, putting in long hours, finishing those projects to hit those deadlines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. The, uh, the presentation side of it is almost... Uh it's not exactly a value add necessarily is if you can make the, if you can make the answers easily uh, available in Excel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, uh, you've mentioned a few specific special projects that you've gone after and found, um, uh, in delivered insights on, I'm curious, uh, on a more regular cadence, weekly, monthly, quarterly, are, uh, at search spring, are you, leading the efforts to you know, uh, capture the KPIs and build the dashboards or um, you know, make the metrics easily accessible so that your company can see you know, where, where things are going well, where things aren't, and focus attention on um, fixing the things that are not. Like, are, is that part of your purview as well? Yeah, so it's funny. Uh, next week is when I'll start closing the books for the prior month. Uh, and so my job is yeah. kind of cyclical where the first eight uh, days of every month, I'm reviewing all the metrics from the previous month, closing out our KPI dashboard with all departments information, double checking for accuracy, and then we present it at an all hands meeting, uh, I think the eighth, maybe ninth business day of every month. And so we're very transparent. We have spend um, from different departments, 
and we have revenue from sales, customer success, uh, what that looks like month over month and why it changed. We have our NPS score, transparent. Um, and yeah, we, we need to provide that data because I mean, we're all working towards something and we're all working for a company that we believe in. And if we didn't have that data transparent, it's kind of like, well, what are we working for? And so knowing that what I do in my day-to-day -day job affects the business and hear the numbers to prove it, like that's very powerful. And I think every company should share those numbers uh, and really speak to a departmental level of, hey, customer success pulled in these numbers, uh, expansion was super high, which is awesome, or hey, we had more churn than expected, uh, here are a few reasons why. I love our engineering team, they do, a uh, man, it is basically what went well, what did not go well, and uh, it's typically really funny. Hey, we had this really dumb mistake, we put a period when we should have done a comma or vice versa, and it broke everything, well, here's how we fixed it. <laughs> Next time we know, uh, attention to detail. And it's small things like that where, hey, like, no matter what role you, you're in, sometimes you fail and that's okay. Let's laugh about it, learn from it, and move on. And I think that's really building unique culture at Search Spring. And yeah, and I think I got a little off topic. But yeah, KPIs. <laughs> definitely no, yeah, do that. that's good stuff. I was gonna ask. I was gonna ask you a follow up because um, you said, uh, you know, it's it's almost the end of uh, October 2021 right now for anyone listening in the future. <laughs> but uh, in in a couple of days, it's gonna be November and. You're going to start pulling, uh, pulling in the updated reports from the previous month. Uh, now, is that something that's uh, static in Excel? Is it, uh, is it uh, live and on demand? And yeah, what's the what's the experience like for people who might want to get a month to date or quarter to date update uh, when it's not quite the end of the period? Yeah, so we live at a, a couple different platforms. So we'll we'll capture data out of our CRM. We have a couple of Google Sheets that teams will update in real time throughout the month. And so it's taking a second glance at those, um, double checking the information in our billing system and our CRM, and then making sure those are accurate. Um, and so engineering spend, we get end of month from our billing. Uh, we know what's going into the product, and then we know revenue coming out of, or from our product, and we kind of match the two to see Hey, what is, what does it look like? Um, yeah, but yeah, we do. We have a lot of Google sheets floating around that departments update mm -hmm. and those will funnel into the KPI dashboard. Gotcha. Yeah. There's some of those leading indicators that can be tracked in real time. And then the cost stuff is often in retro, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so, so the team, so it's really not real time though. It's, um, it's, you know, whenever they get around to updating it. Yeah, and so... Is that going to cause problems for you guys? Do you get, are you going to have to fix that soon, do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely going to be a future initiative. How can we automate some uh, of these? Um, some of yeah. it, I, I don't know if we'll ever move off manual, just because taking notes of a customer that churned in real time and updating that on uh, our CRM, as well as a, we do a Google Sheet, I think those notes in real time are more important than, oh, like, let's look back in the prior month and try to figure out why that customer churned. Like, I think that's super important. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, definitely some, some room for automation. You kind of hinted there at uh, feedback loops. And I know that's something that um, you care deeply about is making sure that in sales and marketing, there's constant feedback loops from sales marketing all the way through to CS uh, and when you're learning about uh, hearing from customers and then feeding feeding information back from the customer to sales and marketing to make them more effective. Uh, what have you put in place or what have you been involved in putting in place at Search Spring to enable feedback loops so the sales and marketing are armed with the uh, latest, greatest uh, information to do their jobs great? Yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily take... Uh credit for helping with feedback loops uh, kind of happened organically um, and some of it was already in place but we typically if we have an idea we want to discuss we'll bring in a handful of people from different departments 
we'll brainstorm it, put it on a whiteboard. Does this make sense? Do we have buy-in from everybody? Perfect. And then uh, it's funny, our CMO just put in Slack, hey, there's a change we want to make in Salesforce. Uh, this is what it is. What are y'all's thoughts? And made it transparent and put it in uh, our sales Slack channel and marketing Slack channel. And that way we get feedback from everybody. Does this make sense? What reports does it affect? Who's going to input the data? Uh, what is the goal of it? What are we going to get out of it? And so just doing kind of a smaller group whiteboard and then opening it up transparently for everyone to provide feedback. It's huge. Uh, not only that. That's a good, uh, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say we, we do a lot of shadowing. Uh, rather, once a month, we'll do a rotational, like, who do you want to shadow this month? And having the opportunity for sales to shadow marketing, marketing to shadow sales, customer success. Uh, it's funny, they can even shadow uh, the finance team just to take a look at the numbers, ask questions. Uh, I think it's very powerful. I got to shadow one of our SDRs last month, and it was awesome. I got to relive some of the sales days a little bit. Uh, see their process, yeah. gave some pointers. He showed me some new stuff, which is awesome. So just being able to be one-on-one -on -one with somebody in a different department to see how they do their job, very powerful. You brought up something about uh, changes and the process that you guys go through to vet out any changes before putting them in place and, and making changes to Salesforce, for instance. Is that something that you're involved in? I'm sure you are because it probably there's a lot of downstream impacts. Talk about all the different dynamics that you guys go through and the change controls that you put in place to search spring and how you're involved in that. Yeah, so if someone wants to make a change, uh, we typically have a few conversations about it. I mean, one, we need to understand why, what uh, currently lives in our CRM, why is it not giving us the outcome that we need? Um, so what's wrong with it how can we make it better next step is all right if we were to change it what would it look like and then really before we get any further we got to ask well, what is it going to break <laughs> is it going to break current reporting uh, that we've done historically do we need to change historic data to match the new filters or the new um, naming convention whatever it might be um, and then as a move forward strategy who's going to be filling out that data in the crm is it going to be sales? Is it marketing? Is it customer success? Um, do we need to have a data check uh, at the end of every month to make sure it's valid and it is being filled out? Is it a mandatory field? Like there's so many different things that go into that. And so there's tons of discussion with all interested parties. And then before we even do it, we fill out a change request form, um, fill out a lot of information about the why, the how, the when, and then we just, we do it, we go for it. Um, so there's plenty of spot checks before we go forward. That right there is the exact reason why you hire a business analyst early on at a company, because we've seen over the years that, uh, particularly in sales and marketing, sales and marketing leaders, there's so much turnover every every two years the sales there's a new sales leader and marketing leader, which means, you know, on average, every one year there's a new person. and. <laughs> And if there aren't good change controls in place, it's like a uh, sales leader or the marketing leader can just add a new field and, uh, hey, I need this report. Or, like, can we change how this automation works? Or this, And it, it just breaks stuff. So after f you know four, five, six years, <laughs> Salesforce is a complete mess and it takes so much reconfiguration and you almost, it's better, you're almost better off starting from scratch because the historical data is garbage anyway. <laughs> but that is the exact reason, you know, what you just walked through with change controls is the exact reason to have somebody who, uh, who uh, values the kind of the integrity, the sanctity of the data at an organization. Yeah, it's funny. So I'm guilty of this as well. But I hear a lot of, well, this is how we did it in our old world. And while I think that's fine, I think when you join a new company, your goal is to build something new. Like you can take things that worked well and implement it. And I think it's fantastic, but really you don't want to adapt your new company to be exactly like your old company. Like that's part of the reason you left. Like we, we got to work together and build something new, but we got to do it together. And if everyone that came to search spring was like, Hey, 
we did this in our old world, let's do it. I mean, we would no longer be search ring. We'd be another company. And so just understanding when you join a new team, really understand how they do things, why they do things, uh, bring in pieces that are great from your old position, but I mean, you're there to build something new and I think that's special. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know that you're not only uh, doing an awesome job, you know, as a business analyst, but you're also super interested in RevOps. And you mentioned you're hiring a sales ops person. Where where do you go, Zach, to educate yourself as a, as an analyst who's also, you know, deeply embedded with revenue operations stuff? Where do you go to educate yourself? Yeah, so it's it's funny. So I started this role seven months ago, which is wild to believe. Uh, I came from different industry, different position, so everything's basically new. Uh, yeah. but with that being said, I mean, I'm always curious, hungry to learn. And so my first stop was Google revenue operations. What is it? And after going down <laughs> hundreds of rabbit holes, cause it's endless, uh, I found some amazing communities on Slack, uh, different organizations. I mean, there's a wealth of knowledge out there and it, it doesn't stop with just, Hey, I joined an organization. I'm learning like you gotta be active and ask people who have done it before. Hey, what worked well for you? What are some things I should watch out for? And I think it's starting those conversations and just learning from people is the biggest asset. Uh, and Google helps. There's a lot of articles out there, uh, but it's just like looking through data. You got to filter out the noise. A lot of it's, uh, mm. hey, RevOps is cool. This is why it's growing. But it doesn't tell you how to do analysis yeah. or how to build a team or why your specific company needs it it's it's very general so yeah go go out and talk to people what are your some of your favorite uh, slack communities yeah i definitely say uh whiz ops is fantastic um everyone there yeah. are power users big fan of Wiz. yeah big fan of whiz ops their their founder brad smith was a former guest uh episode four i believe awesome market excellence yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's the community is very active. If you have any specific questions about a platform, there is someone there that can answer it. It's insane. Um, they know their stuff and they're ready to help, which is the best part. All right, a couple more last questions for you, Zach. I want to hear about the uh, RevOps team that you're trying to build and, and like how how you're identifying the uh, the identifying and then planning on filling the gaps in the whole RevOps function at search spring. And then I have one more question about RevOps that I'll save after you answer that. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So we're, we're definitely growing. I, I see a need for RevOps. Um, and really it's more than just aligning teams. It's, we need to strategize and have someone that can handle data in very specific sets. So we need someone that, does sales data, marketing data, customer success data. Let's bring it all together with our data experts and talk about it as a uh, as thought leaders. What are we doing with this? How can we enhance it? How can we enable our teams? And so I think that's really what I would like to focus on when trying to build up positions around this instead of getting uh, just someone that handles the tech stack. Like, that's great. But I mean, if we all work together, we can all learn bits and pieces and really help each other take care of tech. Like I, I have trouble seeing that as one person's job, like that's, that's the company's job. Everyone should have a hand in their tech. Uh, and of course everyone should review it. Just not admin, just not administrative rights. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's fair. <laughs> um, but yeah, really, I just, I want to take this from an analyst perspective and get people that know how to present data and make actionable insights. Love it. All right. So who should RevOps report to? You know, I actually love, so I currently report to finance and I love it. It's a third party outside of the influence of sales, marketing, customer success. So you live in your own bubble, plus you make decisions that have financial implications. So I think it's the perfect way to set up a team. All right, there you go. We, we've heard all sorts of answers, but um, I like that one. Um, finance is, is definitely one that we hear, and there's a lot. Of, I think a lot of it depends on the 
the, the product the company is selling yeah. to and, and who, um, you know, some companies are, are product led. And so RevOps um, might report into somebody who's more focused on, on uh, or more in tune with the product. And others are more sales led and they focus on, you know, it's, it's the CRO is the best person. But um, why do you think that, uh, why do you think CFO is the right reporting structure at Search Spring? Yeah, so when we do uh, our reconciliation for MRR, that feeds into cash forecasting, which then feeds into hiring decisions or if we want to change tech stack. And so rolling up the finance allows us to have deeper conversations about money uh, and budgeting, whereas our focus is revenue. Like, let's talk to the money people and make sure Hey, like if we were to make these decisions, what is the trickle down effect? Could we hire a junior or a senior role if we were to get X amount more revenue? And so I think that helps with strategic planning for hiring. Um, and I think that's huge when you're building out your team and growing because knowing how much money you have and what that means in the market as far as salary is massive. And if you pull one lever or two levers and you can maximize that salary cap and hire, let's say two people, because you made the correct business decisions to grow revenue, even better. Um, whereas if you report to sales, like a big focus is let's sell a lot. Well, that's good, but we need customer success. You need marketing to really enhance that. And so, yeah, being third party outside of all of those bubbles, uh, but being able to interact is huge. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Zach, thanks so much for coming on Go to Market Excellence. Uh, you know, if anyone wants to follow Zach, he's uh, hot, coming in hot on LinkedIn, so be sure to follow him there. And uh, best of luck, Zach, uh, finishing out this year. And I can't believe you're only seven months in. It sounds like you've gotten a lot done and, and you've got a lot of big plans for the future. So good luck. Hey, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. I had a blast.